Hello everyone, it's Albert and in this video I'm going to be discussing some recent work I've been doing as those who watch my videos probably know I've been writing the ebook series on the whole question of Jesus mythicism particularly that relating to the idea of Jesus being a parallel to various pagan gods and how ridiculous the whole thing is and up until now I've basically been concentrating on that end of the Jesus mythicist spectrum um, but one of the things I wanted to actually get to in, to combat next, and I'm in a book series I'm writing on that, is the, the claim by some that the Apostle Paul did not believe in a living, breathing, historical Jesus who walked the earth, etc. Um, and the idea put forward, primarily through the work of Earl Doherty, uh, is that that all the gods of antiquity lived in this ethereal sublunar realm. Um, it's, and he claims this comes from Middle Platonism. Well, actually, if you read scholars on ancient religions and you read scholars on Middle Platonism, it isn't there. Uh, none of them actually mention it, and Doherty can't actually point to any place where this actually occurs. It's pretty much from the imagination of Earl Doherty. Uh, but he has a lot of fans who bought into the idea. And, and what Doherty does, and other mythicists who follow his lead, is they'll take certain passages of Paul and treat them completely in isolation and not take Paul's material as a whole, a letter as a whole, because what happens is when you take Doherty's interpretations of each passage and plug it back into the letter, it the letter makes no sense whatsoever. It's just utterly ridiculous. At one point, for example, Doherty will speak of, the, of when Paul's speaking of this great mystery that has been revealed, and Doherty will, refers to the mystery of the ethereal Christ or something like that which co it comes the passage comes at the end of Romans um, in fact when you go to Romans the mystery he's talking about is the mystery of salvation usually when Paul's referring to the mystery he's referring to the mystery of salvation of being saved through faith and not by the works of the law and that's the great mystery he's referring to so it it just none of his material makes any sense because it comes at the end of Romans so and it's a summary of what he's been saying and nowhere in the whole of Romans does he ever mention any ethereal Christ uh, in any explicit manner. I mean, it's just not there. But all of Romans, all it's about is the being saved through faith and not the works. Well, that's the entire theme of Romans. And so when he's summarizing that, that's the mystery he's referring to. In fact, he says it right in the passage, you know, through the obedience of faith. And it really makes me wonder, you know, does Doherty understand the writings of Paul at all um, and I don't think he does or or if I at least I hope he doesn't because otherwise it would come out as as him looking being extremely deceptive in his material and and what would I would suggest for Christians who want to combat this sort of thing is the what I found is the best way to do it and it's the way I'm approaching it in the book I'm writing is to take the the various passages that Doherty cites in a particular letter and just write down the passages and then go and then start at the beginning of the letter and start reading the letter and when it gets to one of his passages see if that makes any sense with what's been there before and you'll find it doesn't that there's a theme to these letters and what he says actually violates the theme violates the context um, it makes no sense it, but but if you can take it in isolation and say see this is what this means and you go oh wow really but when you put it back in the letter it makes no sense and and that's what's occurring again and again um and Doherty does not for example understand that the huge barrier Paul puts between law and gospel uh how his in his writings in in all this in many of his letters at least he he's referring to how the gospel the, the gospel saves the law can the law condemns or and convicts the whole purpose of the law um that and he, when he refers to the law he's not just referring to the law of moses he's referring to the to the the moral code also because at one in one he like paul for example writes of of how the jews have the law of moses but the um they have the law of moses but the gentiles have the also have the law written in their hearts, the moral code that written in their hearts, and they become a law unto themselves. So he's speaking of the moral code in general and, and how to stand before a holy God, and and you can't do it. 
that you're that you're on you know, he says none is righteous no not one he speaks of of man knowing what the truth is but suppressing it in unrighteousness etc etc and then he says you know since we have no righteousness of our own he talks about um how the gospel had through faith in christ we have christ righteousness imputed to us etc so that's his whole theme the, the the law convicts and condemns but cannot save you the gospel saves you so that is why paul spends places so much emphasis on the death and resurrection of christ since that is the heart of the gospel that is what say it's through faith in christ and his resurrection that you will one day be resurrected and by the way since you're having faith in christ's resurrection if it isn't a real resurrection you're not going to have a real resurrection so right away you see that this that his theory just falls apart um once you understand the context paul's law versus gospel another thing that really does constantly is creates a false god versus jesus dichotomy and what i mean by that is that doherty will take some passage which attributes something to god and doherty will say well if there was an historical jesus it should have been attributed to jesus you know like at one point at various points paul will refer to the gospel of god um, but he says well if, if jesus exists, it should have been the gospel of jesus and, and i'll in one of the examples that will have that but what, what it turns out is that paul seeing god and jesus in his eyes are united in purpose and divine power he attributes them interchangeably sometimes to both sometimes to one sometimes the other because in his eyes what what is of god is also of christ and what is of christ is also of god and in fact when you talk about the gospel of god he does mention the gospel of god in it, he does call it the gospel of god in places but he calls it the gospel of christ in places too but Doherty only focuses on the one and says, see, see, he calls it the gospel of God, therefore it doesn't, you, you know, Christ doesn't exist. Uh, well, when he calls it the gospel of Christ, does that mean he doesn't believe God exists? I mean, you can't have it both ways. And that's what Doherty attempts to do here. And it just, it's, it's totally bogus. Um, and, and so what you end up with is just this morass of nonsense um and it just makes no sense in the context and what, what i'm going to do is take a couple of passages that he concentrated so and then there in fact a couple of them are are among his top 20 um best passages like for where he says you know the this this alleged silence on G, on jesus on the his on the gospel christ that paul should have mentioned jesus here and and show you exactly just how utterly ridiculous the whole thing is um and and it, it should be pretty obvious after these few passages what what's really going on here and 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 how, how just completely nonsensical the whole argument is okay first i'm well, this is an online article he has with 200 missing references to the gospel of jesus in the new testament epistles and and i'm at his top 20 and, I, and i'm going to take basically some of the top five, top two or three here um and and just to give you an example and then i'll take one other example that i'd like to go over but let's start out with romans 1 19 through 20 where it states for all that may be known of God by men lies plain before their eyes. Indeed, God himself has disclosed it to them as invisible attributes. You notice that he makes, he uses the ellipsis to take some things out. Have been made visible again, the ellipsis in the things he has made. And the way Doherty describes this is, my first choice is a somewhat innocuous seeming passage, and yet one which reveals a telling void in the mind of an early Christian writer like Paul. Unlike later commentators from the second century on, Paul here shows no conception that Jesus on earth had been a reflection of God himself, the Son demonstrating the Father's invisible attributes in his own incarnated person. Even more important, how could Paul fail to conceive and express the idea that Jesus himself was the primary revealer of all that may be known of God. It is difficult to explain how any Christian writer cognizant of a recent life and ministry of Jesus could show such a void on any role played by Jesus on earth, and yet we meet that silence at every turn as we shall see. The really shocking thing, actually, is 
And the one that no one, I can't understand is how anyone could read that passage and give it the interpretation that what he just did. Um, because what Paul's speaking about there, again, it's the law and gospel thing. He's speaking about the law, the law written in men's hearts. And what he's trying to, the idea he's trying to put forth is that God has revealed this into men's hearts. Not about Christ, he's talking about the moral law, that it's been revealed to all men, and so all men are, are to be held responsible to it. All men are to be held accountable. You can't escape this. And, he, and he's this whole passage is about being convicted that, that even... If you have no knowledge of the God of Israel, God has given, written that knowledge on your heart that you should know it. And yet men go off worshiping idols and, and of, made, you know, images of corruptible things rather than God himself, the invisible God. That's what this message of this passage is about. It has nothing to do with the later revelation of Christ where, where all of God's promises are fulfilled in the gospel. That's not what it has to do with, but he's using this and saying, see, he should have mentioned Jesus here. Well, no, he, he, right here he's talking about the law being convicted in men's hearts and how all men know this and suppress that truth and unrighteousness. But that you would never get that reading Dilworthy's interpretation, though, would you? Okay, you, would, you wouldn't understand. You would see that and say, wow, why doesn't he mention Jesus here? Well, the revelation he's talking about is not the revelation of Christ. It's not how God... God is, is reflected in Christ on earth. He's, he's talking about how God is reflected in nature and how this makes men guilty, even if they had never heard of Christ or never heard of the God of Israel. That's what he's talking about. He's saying that all men are responsible, even if they had never heard of it. That's what he's talking about. But you'll never get that from Merrill Derwin's interpretation. Now, just to prove my point that I just made, let's... Here you see, remember it's Romans 1, chapter 1, verses 19 through 20. Let's go to Romans 1 and read it in context. And I'll begin at verse 18. And you notice they, they gave a little heading here for unbelief and its consequences, uh, which should give you some idea what this is about. But let's start at verse 18 and read it in context. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Funny, why does why was all of this not excised out of that verse? For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Thus, we see what the whole, it's about. It's about man having the law of God written in, in, on him, written in, in his being, and turning away from God and creating idols. It, it has to do with idolatry, and, and, and he goes on to say that, therefore, God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, etc., etc. That's what he's talking about. It has nothing to do with, the divine revelation of Christ at this point. He's talking about law, not gospel. After he speaks of the law, this is the beginning. After he speaks of the law, then he turns to the gospel, but that's not at this point of the letter. But this gives you an idea of how completely distorted is Doherty's interpretation of this passage and how it, how it has no bearing and remember something. Doherty lists this as his number one passage. This is the best he has. Well, if this is the best, you can imagine what the rest are like. Now, having disposed of number one on his list, let's go to number two, which is at the other end of Romans. In fact, it's the last few verses of the last few verses of the letter, 
um, where he states, Doherty states, this is one of several passages throughout the epistles which give us a clear picture of the nature of the early Christian movement. It tells us the source of Paul's knowledge about the Christ and how the movement started. At the same time, it leaves no room in the picture for an historical Jesus. Well, let's see what it says. Glory be to God who has strengthened you through my gospel and proclamation about Jesus Christ, through his revelation of the mystery which was kept secret for long ages, now disclosed and made known through the prophetic writings at the command of the eternal God that all nations might obey through faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Doherty then goes on to say, the concept of a divine mystery, a secret kept by God for long ages, recurs several times in the Pauline Corpus. The plain meaning of the above words would seem to define the mystery as Christ himself. Now revealed through Paul's gospel after be, being hidden for long ages, there is no occasion for understanding any incarnation in these words, and we have the added element of what is known and proclaimed to be proclaimed to the world comes through the scriptures. Well, actually, if you read the letter, which obviously Doherty hasn't done without, at least with, not without any great understanding, the mystery Paul's referring to is the mystery of salvation. That's usually when he refers to a mystery, that's usually what it, it deals with, is the economy of salvation, the idea of how we are saved. And in this case, it is salvation through faith, not through works of the law. That's the entire content of Romans. Read the letter for yourself. This is the end of the letter where he's summarizing his point. He's at the very end of the letter here. He's summarizing his point, how we are saved through faith. And he says, glory be to God who has strengthened you through my gospel and proclamation about Jesus Christ, through his revelation of the mystery which was kept for long ages, now disclosed and made through the prophetic writings. Well, what is he talking? What is this mystery he's talking about? At the command of the eternal God. And what is, the, and what is this mystery? Well, he tells you right here. The at the command of the eternal God, that all nations might obey through faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Basically, you obey through faith in Jesus Christ. That is, that is the mystery. The mystery of salvation. That's what the entire letter is about. If he's, if he's summarizing here a mystery, he should have mentioned the mystery earlier in the letter. Well, where earlier in the letter does he ever explicitly talk about some ethereal Christ in a sublunar realm? Nowhere. But re I, I challenge those who were accepting Doherty's nonsensical interpretations to read the letter to the Romans. All through the letter, it's talking about salvation through faith, how we have the imputed righteousness of Christ, etc. It doesn't talk about an ethereal Christ. Read the letter. As I said, the best way to combat this nonsense is to start at the beginning of the letter, go through it, and see if his interpretations make any sense in context, and they do not. And this is a perfect example. Having disposed of that little bit of nonsense, let us now move on to the third one on the list. And here it is, 1 Thessalonians 2.2, Paul writing to the church Thessalonica. And the, the passage states, We had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the face of great opposition. Now, what does he write about this? It says, early Christian writers like Paul are constantly referring to the message they carry as the gospel of God. This is again, one of, this is one of those God versus Jesus false dichotomies I mentioned. They also talk of the work of God, the saving actions of God, the call of God, etc. If these apostles were preaching a message about an historical Jesus who had himself taught about God in his own relationship to him, surely they would style it the gospel of Jesus. And he goes on to say, why is there no mention of the epistles of an earthly ministry of Jesus? He says, on the other hand, if Jesus is a spiritual figure, a mystery known only through scripture and God's revelation of him, then Paul's message is indeed the gospel of God. I want you to notice something, um, and, and this also goes back to the logical fallacies of this position, is that there is a definite double standard here. He says, well, why doesn't he explicitly mention the earthly ministry of Jesus or even earthly? Well, he does. But what happens is whenever one of those passages comes up that points to an, an obvious interpretation as an earthly Jesus, Doherty goes through all sorts of mental gymnastics to try to turn the verse on its head and say it means something else. But when you plug it back in the context, it's 
it makes no sense. And that presents a real problem, because if you take verses in isolation and you supply meanings for them that will fit your interpretation, and then you plug them back in the letter as a whole, and they make no sense, you have to ask, what would someone reading that letter have thought? What's the obvious meaning? If you, which is why I suggest starting at the beginning and reading through. If you were getting this letter, what, what would you think? Um, now, you, that isn't perfect because obviously you're not in the context that they are. But reading the letter in a just, okay, does that interpretation make any sense? Um, if you read that Jesus is born of a woman, what would that mean to you? It seems sounds like something obvious to me, but. Um, what would you make of that? Um, uh, the, the interpretation he gives just simply when you plug things back in the text, uh, when it talks about Jesus being basically uh, under the law, you know, being born under the law, be, uh, being made subject to the law, etc., and then fulfilling it. Well, to be subject to the law, you have to be human, because the law doesn't apply to spiritual beings; it applies to human beings. That's who the law of Moses was given to. It was given specifically descendants of Abraham. So how does that fit into this picture? It doesn't. It, it makes no sense. And that's a problem because if you can't, if it makes no sense to someone reading it in the first century, then it's just an illegitimate interpretation. And that's what Doherty has. But also what he creates is, is a double standard because he says, well, why doesn't he explicitly mention an earthly Jesus? As I said, there are mentions of an earthly Jesus, but he goes through all sorts of gymnastics to turn them into something else. But the same, that the same should apply to him. Why doesn't he mention an ethereal Jesus explicitly? He doesn't. Nowhere does he say Jesus is explicitly Jesus exists in the sublunar realm. In, in Doherty merely reads that into every passage. It's not there, though. And that would not be the default. In if you're writing a letter about someone who you said was a, a, a seed of Abraham and uh, born to a woman and made subject to the law of Moses, well, that would all kind of sound like a, this fellow was a Jew um, in, in the first century. And it, it, that's really what it sounds like. And that would be the default interpretation, rather than turning on its head, because he nowhere, nowhere mentions Jesus being in some sublunar realm. I don't see that anywhere. You know, where, where all the other gods are, according to Doherty, I don't see that anywhere. It's not there. It's not there. It's simply forced in so he can get to the conclusion he wants, but once you plug it back in the passage, the passage is back into the whole of the letter. It makes, it's, it makes Swiss cheese of the letter. Um, so you see the double standard at work. In, in, in the way he interprets things. And, and that presents a real problem. And we'll see again what happens now. Let's go into the next passage. Uh, we'll, we'll see this in application again, uh, where he simply creates a nonsensical meaning out of something. The next passage, which is the third one on his top, 20 and that's the last one of this i'm just going to deal with the top three here on, the, on these passages but it should give you an, a, an idea of what's coming since these are the best three he has remember is that is first thessalonians chapter 2 verse 2 which reads we had courage in our god to declare to you the gospel of god in the face of great opposition and he wrote, Doherty writes, early Christian writers like Paul are constantly referring to the message they carry as the gospel of God. They also talk about the work of God, the saving actions of God, the call of God, etc. If these apostles were preaching a message about an historical Jesus who had himself taught about God in his own relationship to him, surely they would stop, style it the gospel of Jesus. Why is there no mention in the epistles of an earthly ministry of Jesus? On the other hand, if Jesus is a spiritual figure, a mystery known only through the scripture and God's revelation of him, then Paul's message is indeed the gospel of God, and God is the primary savior. What's happening in this passage is what I referred to earlier as Doherty's God versus Jesus false dichotomy. Um, and what occurs is that Doherty is trying to make hay out of Paul's crediting to God the gospel. 
which Doherty claims should have been credited to Jesus had the latter been an historical figure. But as I explained already, the Paul commonly credits things to both God and Jesus interchangeably, since they are united in his eyes in purpose and power. In this case, the use of the gospel of God really has no bearing on the issue of Jesus' historicity. Because, let's say, he's, he's saying that if, if Jesus existed, he would have called it the gospel of Jesus, the gospel of Christ, or something like that. Well, what if he did elsewhere? What would that mean? That would mean Jesus exists. If this means Jesus doesn't exist, if he calls it the gospel of Jesus somewhere else, it means Jesus did exist, right? You can't have it both ways. And in fact, in the Pauline corpus, there are 17 occurrences of where the gospel is credited to either God or to, to Jesus in some fashion. And of those 17, it's credited to Jesus 11 times to God six times. Does that mean Jesus exists two thirds more times than God? I, I don't know. Um, it, it, it makes no sense what he's saying, because if you take that and put it, those the passage saying, his interpretation saying, because it says gospel of, of God and not gospel of Jesus, Jesus didn't exist as an historical figure. And then you go to another passage where it says gospel of, gospel of Christ. Well, then how do you, how do you balance those two? It doesn't make any sense. You can't have it both ways. But he, you notice, he nowhere mentions those other passages. He only, he always seizes on the ones that say the gospel of God, something of God rather than of Christ. But he ignores all the ones that say the same thing about Christ. And as I said, 17 times in the new, in the polling corpus is the gospel credited to either God or Jesus. It's credited to God exactly six times in Romans 1.1 1, 1, and 15.16 in Romans. In 2 Corinthians 11.7, and in 1 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, which is this passage, 2.8 and 2.9, which is shortly afterwards. But the gospel of Christ is used in Romans 15.9, in 1 Corinthians 9.12, in 2 Corinthians 2.12, 9.14, and 10.14, in Galatians 1.7, in Philippians 1.27, and in this same letter, 1 Thessalonians 3.2. So obviously he's using these pretty interchangeably. And that's just the gospel of Christ. There's also the gospel of his son, and in context, the his is referring to is a personal pronoun referring to God. So it means the gospel of God's son, which is Romans 1 9. He also refers to the gospel of the glory of Christ in 2 Corinthians 4 4, and the gospel of our Lord Jesus in 2 Thessalonians 1 8. So that means out of 17 times, 11 of them refer to Christ, 6 to God. Why doesn't that mean Christ exists? Why do we only hear of the passages where it says the gospel of God and not the passages where it says the gospel of Christ? Because it doesn't fit his pet theory. That's why. It simply doesn't fit his theory. Therefore, he ignores what doesn't, what doesn't make his theory work. He just takes isolated passages. But as I said, once you pour his meaning into them and pour it back into the, put it back into context, it makes no sense whatsoever. And this occurs again and again with Doherty's interpretations. And here again is a perfect example of the complete inconsistency, the double standards of his interpretations. He has to twist things and, and take things out of context and, and isolate things. Because if he, as I said, if he, he can isolate this one passage and say, see, he said gospel of God instead of Christ, but ignore all the other times he said gospel of Christ. And what does that mean? What does that make of his theory? Well, you, 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 be the, you decide that one. Obviously, there's a lot more I could say about Doherty's writings, particularly in relation to the epistles of Paul, and I will go into them in detail in the book, but I think it's, it should be pretty obvious already that the, his meanings just are totally illegitimate. They, they, and those were the top three of these alleged silences of, of, of Jesus in the Gospels. So I, I intentionally took the top ones he had. And obviously this video is long enough already, or I could go into more, but I, I think that should give you an idea of what's going on here. And I don't know, is Doherty just ignorant of these things? Is he being misleading? Or is he so blinded? by his ideology, that he can't see what's in front of him. Take that first example. That was his number one example. And just read it. Go, go to Romans 1 and start reading. And it'll be obvious.
I, but he, he can't do that. You see, as I said, they isolate things, isolate verses, say, see, and dangle them in front of you and say, see, this is what this means. But when you take all those little pieces and plug them back into the letter, it makes no sense. It just makes no sense. You know, the gospel of God, that means Jesus doesn't exist? Really? You think that? Well, does, the, does that mean Jesus doesn't exist six times and he does exist 11? It, it's 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 utterly ridiculous but this is what i've come to expect from this sort of material and i frankly had, had hoped that it would, that doherty's material and carriers that which i haven't really dealt with in this video would be more of a challenge but it really isn't and i think this should make clear why and on that note in all things made to god be all the glory and until next time god bless